Hallelujah, God's good. So I've got um, three things that I want to testify about that I God just I experienced God established this in my life concerning finances, and so three questions that I um, ask myself based on these things that God um, I believe God taught me. The one is, am I content? And I didn't have the notes before the time that Pastor shared, but am I content? The second thing is. Am I steering my heart in an accurate way concerning finances? And the other, um, the last one is, am I faithful in what God gives me? So the first one, am I content? Um, so I've got this uh, practice very early in the morning. I, I like to wake up early and then I go for a long walk and that's my time with God. Uh, awesome time with God um, before the day starts. And uh, something that God just established in my heart is that... Um, just to thank him um, for for what he does and and what he provides in my life, and um, this has become such a such a awesome treasure in my time with God. Is that oftentimes I would just thank God for for things, and what's so astonishing to me is that oftentimes what I thank God for is not always the big things. Yes, the big things as well, but but so many things that in the past I've taken for granted. Um, just thanking God for my wife, just thanking God for my, for my children, thanking God that I can go home and there's a fridge and I can open up the fridge and there's food inside, thanking God that I can go to a job, thanking God that I've got legs to walk on, thanking God that I can hear and that I can see and that I can have the privilege to spend time with God. And so the principle that, that um, I just experienced what God established in my life is that so oftentimes we think that, you know, it's the big things that should wow us. Um, it's, it's the major things. But you know what? We don't need a lot just to experience um, the simplicity of life and what, what God intends for you and me. God, if you open up your eyes and you allow God's spirit to open up your eyes, your whole life every day is, is flooded with God's goodness in so many little things. And may God help us through His Spirit to open up our eyes to see His goodness in the simplicity, in the small things that He blesses us out of His loving hand. He's as a good Father. He blesses us with that. And so that's something that I experienced God opened up in my life, especially the last two years. The second question um, that I'm asking myself based on what God did is, am I steering my heart accurately with my finances? The Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And a perspective that God um, uh, established in my life that, that money is a tool. I'm not serving money. I'm not working for money, but money works for me. And it's a tool to steer my heart and to put my heart in the right place. And when I apply principles like, like tithing, I actually break the power of mammon over my life, and I steer my heart to be to be at the right place. Tithing is not a theological thing. Tithing is not this or that. Tithing is a direct um, call on where your heart is. I'm going to say again, oftentimes people want to make tithing this big theological discussion and debate. Tithing is simple. It's a test to test where your heart is. And in God's loving kindness, he gives you this thing to break the power of mammon. Do you know that there's a spiritual dimension to money? And when you apply God's principle, it steers your heart and it connects your heart in a very practical way to God. And so Siobhan will testify when she testifies, but but by God's grace, this is something that we have meticulously applied in our marriage and in our lives to be really faithful um, and in tithing, whether, whether we've got money or whether we really had no money. And I mean literally no money to buy food. And, um, and what an awesome privilege still to connect your heart and to steer your heart in times where there's nothing in a way where you can just express your love to God. I oftentimes, when I preached, used this example, and I'm, I want to leave you with this example before I go to the last point, but when somebody comes into our home, I was brought up in the Afrikaner culture, and when somebody sits in your lounge and you have coffee and tea and you serve the people, what do you do? Well, I've been taught you, you take it 
to the guests and you serve the guests first before you serve yourself and your family. Why? Because it's an act of honor. And that's simply what tithing is. It's you, you take it metaphorically speaking to God and you say, God, you can have first from what you blessed me with. And so the last question and, and something that um, God also um, established in, in our lives is, am I faithful with what God has given me? And um, so oftentimes, um, you know, we, we trust God and God provides. But you know what? God also um, expects us to be faithful in what he, he gives us. And, um, and we're going to give account to that. And, and the definition of faithfulness is that God expects you to multiply what he gives you. If I'm just doing what I have to do and just doing my job at the university where I'm working and just um, doing all my key performance indicators, I'm not faithful. I have to, under God's guidance and under the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, multiply and open up new opportunity. So there's a scripture that I just experienced when I prepared this morning um, in, in Haggai. And Haggai is all about priorities, getting our priorities right and, and being efficient in that. In chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of um, Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. And, um, and the testimony in, in our lives um, is that really when you, when you trust God and when you uh, walk with, um, with the gift even of the prophetic, God oftentimes can, God is with you and he, you become a co-worker with God and what God has placed in your hand can multiply in your hands almost like the five loaves and the two fish to feed the many. And so my question to you is what has God placed in your hand? What has God placed in your hand? We often use the, the slogan, the miracle is in the house. But it's truly like that. Maybe you're sitting here and, and you've got lack. But maybe the miracle is in your house. Maybe it's already there. You just need to tap into God and ask God, God, open up my eyes to see what I have in my hands. And under your guidance, how can I multiply that? And, and in that way, God has um, led Siobhan and myself the past two, three years to to open up new income streams under the guidance of His Spirit. I've never in my life thought that that would be possible in my life. But I, I just grabbed hold of the opportunity. Um, I, I attended the, the business course that was presented by this congregation available to everyone here, the business course of Dr. Jonathan David. I attended that and um, just opened up my heart to what God wants to do. Um, we are faithful with the day words, and being faithful with the day words, God just opened up opportunities for us. And, and it's not about us. The, way, the reason why I'm sharing this is that it's available to you as well. God has given you things in your hand, and, and the prophetic anointing is here. The opportunities are here. And, and in sharing this, I want to encourage you to work with God, what God has placed in your hands under the guidance of His Spirit, and um, I believe you will, uh, God, you will also see God's provision in a supernatural way in that. Amen. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to just testify about a time that went, went really, really tough, and Vieka just touched on it. And the principle that I want to talk about is tithing, and he also touched on tithing, but it didn't start there. It started with my grandmother. She was the one that taught me the principle of tithing. And my grandfather and my grandmother were in a traditional church. And it wasn't taught in that manner to them. But my grandmother read the word and she took it for what it was worth. And she said, God said it and she believed it and she just did it and applied it. So when we stayed together in one house, my grandmother used to take me. I had a little business. I was baking stuff, and uh, then she would say to me, you don't give your tithe after you worked out your profit. Whatever you get in, you give your tithe on, and God will bless the rest. And I remember making the fudge every week. There used to be one packet extra, and I'm thinking like, this is not possible. I've been making this fudge for so long. 
this amount of sugar, this amount of golden syrup, et cetera, et cetera, makes this amount of fudge. But I always had to add 10, 10 grams extra per packet. But I really saw God multiply because my heart's attitude was right. I give him first. And when I got into marriage, it was a principle. Now, I don't know what you believe, whether you believe you give God your tithe from what you get him first or you first deduct all your um, de deductions, whatever. But for me, whatever I get in first is what God has given to me. So this is a principle that we've applied in our marriage. But there was a time when we weren't in unity and we got involved in property and it went really hard because it was at the spike of the property development or property market. And straight after that spike, it was a massive crash and we were right in that crash. I can't remember if it's seven or eight years. It was hard. We, did, we didn't know where our finances were coming from. We didn't know <laughs> where we were going to have money to buy food or anything. But the one thing we did, when the money came in before the bank took the money for the properties, we paid our tithe. And we never lacked anything. Not a thing. Did I have the money for it? No, but I didn't lack anything because I have a good father that promises, taste me in it, whether I will not open the windows of heaven for you, which doesn't mean money is going to come raining down, but it does mean you will not go hungry and you will have enough. So I want to encourage you with that. Number one, husbands and wives, when you make financial decisions, be in unity. Pray together, trust God to you together. If the one experiences we need to sow money, you better be sure that both of you are in unity, that you need to sow for the, for the right person and what the amount is. Don't act in disunity. We learned our lesson. We have since then moved 100% in unity because we know what it can do when we don't. Number two, give your tithe out of honoring. It's the first thing you can do to honor God. He asks 10%. You get to keep 90. Hello, do the math. But the blessing you get by giving that tiny drop is so much more than just 90%. You get the double upon the double because God is good. And even in the times where we had nothing, we didn't have money for food, God was good. He's not good when you have everything you want and everything you need. No, he's good all the time. And he deserves to be honored. He deserves to be loved in the most precious way. And the first way you can do it, sort your heart out. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, beware of the love of money. And then it follows up to says, where God says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So get the love of money out and know that God is good and he will never leave you. Amen. So while we're on the tithing theme, I've got three little things I would like to share. But in Malachi 3 verse 8, it says there, um, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offering. And this is something the Lord showed me when I went through a season of not getting a salary it was very easy when you get a salary because you just take 10% and you tithe and you thank the Lord. But I went through a phase of a few months, eight months or so of getting random funds coming in. And I actually forgot, let's call it all innocence, I forgot to tithe on that. And after that, uh, let's say after six or so months, I realized, whoa, shucks, I haven't been tithing. And then I had a big temptation to say, Lord, be gracious and forgive me. <laughs> you know. But I had to what do you call it, man up, and I had to pay that. And, I, and when you calculate six months of tithes, it, it becomes more than 10%, just by the way. So then it's a little bit more challenging. But in that time, it was very financially difficult. But the grace and the peace I had in my relationship with God was just so amazing. There was just such an overflow in my relationship with Him when we were busy correcting that. And another little thing I wanted to share with you was um, holy versus common. So when you declare something holy, it means it's set apart. 
Okay, when you give it a name. So the Lord started to speak to us about our budget and our finances. How do we allocate money to be holy and to say this is set apart for a specific purpose? It's not just common money. So if the, if the budget is finished for the month of food, then we start eating just bread. But you don't touch the holy money because God has given you a purpose for that. And he told us to start saving up uh, certain funds to be able to bless somebody with it. Um, we didn't know who or what, but we started saving for a few months. And then Leone suddenly had a day word that said, um, so 2,000 rand. And now usually when you get a day word like that, it's quite daunting. And you start thinking, is it metaphoric? You know, does it mean something else? You know, what could be the deeper meaning behind this? You know, and you start wondering all these things. But we knew, okay, we need to sow 2,000. Then we went to look at, at the budget and we saw exactly 2,000 rand. We had already put one side to be able to bless somebody with it. And it was so encouraging to know that four months before that, the Lord already showed us, hey, put this one side for that. And um, I just want to encourage you to, to sit. And, and that's what Leonie and I do now. We sit together and say, Lord, what is it? that you want us to do with not just the 10%, we know what to do with the 10%, but with the 90. What, what must we do with the 90? What, what is your heart? What is your plan? And it's so nice because it's not tension between Leone and myself anymore. It's actually a joy to sit with the Lord and hear from Him His strategy on what to do. And, and it just feels like you're a lot more deliberate. There's a lot more breakthroughs that come when you spend that time together and you plan your finances together. And then the last little thing is provision. Now, the word provision has a very solid word in it, and it's called vision. And then there's this little pro in front of it. So it's for a vision. And we started realizing this when we did the coastal tour last year. We had no funds, and we were about 15 people that needed to go down to Hartenbos and the Mossel Bay area and come back. And we needed to stay there for 10 days, accommodation, food, sound equipment, traveling, all these things. It was a huge budget financially. And uh, we were able to come back with no one having to spend anything, and we had 8,000 rand left afterwards. And we just realized how God's provision was just there. But it took some time to pray and really ask the Lord, is this your vision? Is this your timing? Is it now? Is this the team? And the effort and the time we took to really make sure, spend time with our pastors, our mentors, and prayed about it, the more we clarified that vision that this is what God has said, and it is now, the more confidence we had, even sharing the vision, even walking out in that vision, and we could just see God's provision for the vision. Amen. I want to just start with quoting Pastor earlier in the sermon where he said, I have the privilege and the honor to know God. And that's where it starts, honor. I think a few people have said this now already. We um, honor God with our finances, but even more, God started challenging me on, um, uh, he's my provider. Yes, you are God. And then he said, is that only in your finances? How about emotionally? Can I provide for you emotionally? Can I provide for you <laughs> spiritually? Can I provide for you every other way? We always get stuck on money. And I know there's a saying like, um, money never buys happiness. And then the new saying says, yeah, but no millionaire has ever said that, you know, <laughs> um, kind of thing. But it's, it's, it's not just money. And, and firstly, God is my provider, but God is provision. So if I know him, that's provision. If I need provision for, um, sorry, so if I need provision to go through an emotional tough time in my life, he's there for me. I went through a really emotionally tough time years ago, like a, a what do you call it, la, 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 la. depression, before depression, burnout, depression, combination thing. And um, that's the time where God just showed me, because I kept saying, God, get me out of this pit. And that's what we do, even with our finances, with whatever, like, just take the unhappiness away, just take this bad stuff away. And God was saying, I'm with you in this pit. Can you just allow me? to be with you in this pit. And that's the first time I really got to know God as my provider in every aspect of my life, not just the finances. And um, so, so I want to challenge you to an, allow God in and have God there with you because he is your ultimate provider. And we want to then honor God with our time. We want to honor God with our um, 
rest. We want to honor God with our work. We want to honor God with our emotions. We want to honor God with that. And I, um, I, I want to, so God is my provider in everything. And many times I would pray even for my kids, for myself, when it was like a busy week or a busy day uh, or whatever, then that night I've got this much sleep and I say, God, multiply my sleep. I don't know if you guys seen this um, TikTok. I don't know if it's a TikTok or Instagram. It's a trend. Girl math and boy math. I haven't seen that part, but I've seen the God math one. So God math works like this. Two plus five equals 5,000. God math. <laughs> um, like, like just, it doesn't make sense. Give God 10%. He gives you everything that you need. God math. Um, so everyone just say God math. <laughs> It doesn't always make sense, but let's honor God with that. And I, I, I kind of think of, of where tithing and things like that started was, I think it's Melchizedek, pastor, my theology is not the best. I go with whatever my husband says because he knows more. So apparently he was the first guy to tithe. Um, and it wasn't out of, I need to tithe. It wasn't out of, oh, this uh, leader needs money to survive or something. It was, I honor you. That's why I tithe. Um, so we honor God with our time, with our, um, with our money, with our emotions, with our life. So I just want to encourage you with that. God is your provider. You have the honor and the privilege to know him and to have you with you. doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't, the circumstances doesn't have to change for you to change and for you to have God math in your life. So um, I'm going to... Maybe put a spanner in the works here for what um, <laughs> BFP specifically said. But, I want, but maybe there's one person that this speaks to. Because God has an individual walk with each of us. And it's about what he wants to do in you at this stage. And, uh, and the, the big breakthrough for me was, um, I know BFP now said this thing about being faithful. And you have to multiply and all these things. And that's scriptural. Um, there's the parable about the, the uh, not the sower, the, where the, the talents had to become two or double, had to double, you know. So that's a godly thing. And um, I always had this thing of, okay, you work and then God blesses you and you're doing all your tithing and all that. And then at a stage, um, the, my, my business was doing very well and I was enjoying what I was doing. And it was, I felt like I'm doing you know, I'm being faithful and all these things. And then there, I got a word. It was after about 15 years of, of growing. And um, through pastor, the Lord speaks through pastor. He had a prophetic word where he said, I have to scale down from four to two. And then when I get to a T-junction, turn right. And I'm like, what? And then I realized my practice is extending to four hospitals. And when I drive in the morning, I decide, okay, where am I going to start today? So it would either be a turn, there, there, was a, there was a T junction, and I would either turn left and I go to Pedanomi and Busamid or right to, you know, and, and that was like, now I have to scale down. And I realized, shucks, it's to do with my work. How does it work? And it was in this time of, of uh, COVID and, and people losing their jobs, and everybody's like, and, and I'm like, how can God be asking me this? You know, it, it, it sounds strange because you're supposed to must double and multiply and, Use what you have and make it better. And I've been doing that, and God is saying, no, 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 I want you to scale back. And that was the biggest breakthrough I probably had in a very long time. It was, I remember my husband, he's not here now, but he's amazing. <laughs> he just told me, listen, and it wasn't like, there was a stage, it was about two years that we were only on my income. My, my husband was between jobs. It was, it was just after that, about, I was like, this is what I do. This is, I'm not a provider. Da, da, da. And, um, scale down and this is like my baby you know you started something it's that the baby's now a teenager and now you have to let go um the the things that came through there is marius uh, my husband he, he basically uh, rebuked me <laughs> in a sense he's like helen and it, it was a stage where it wasn't like you know we, we, were, we were fine but it wasn't this like thing and he was telling me helen how do you define success and i'm like and he's like you don't define success in your business by your turnover or how it's multiplying. And I'm like, how, what? <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense, does it? Me? And I'm like, oh, the talent, so that's a double. You have to, he's like, no, 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 stop right there. Yeah? He says, you define 
success by how you're honoring and being faithful to what God is telling you to do. And he was basically up in the morning with Selena, you have to make your decisions, yeah. You know? And I'm like, yeah, but the turnover, we can have so much. He's like, I don't care. Like, what, yeah, your success is not depending on money. It's depending on what is God telling you, and are you going to decide to step into that or not? And that was, okay, okay, God, <laughs> I'm stepping out. And I basically phoned, I gave up my offices, I gave everything away, which make, doesn't make sense. And, and that was the start of one of the biggest breakthroughs in our, in our lives, I believe. Um, things about provision, where, where God was telling me, but, um, you know, it, because in my, in my line of work, if you give, give work away, you're not giving that work away. You're giving the, the, the possibility of referrals to another person, where that doctor used to refer, now it's probably going to refer to that person. So, so you're giving future work away. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. And um, God was telling me, Helen, who's your provider? Like, is this doctor your provider? Or am I your provider? You know, is your job, is your practice, whatever, who's your provider? So I had to go through all these things. And then at a stage, to the last thing I wanted to get to, my personal journey was in the last stage, I had to step so much back that I realized Where's my worth? Because I've been working my whole life and being the one providing, and now I'm not supposed to be a provider. God's my provider, so who am I? So, so, so God uses these principles of money and finances, but he's not, he's not interested in that. He's interested in us, and he's interested in where he wants us to be, and he wants us to just be with him and say, listen, you are my provider. My worth is in you. My definition is in you. I want to be successful in my business because I'm following you, not because my turnover is now more. My turnover is less, but I'm successful. Hope you are well. Um, I want to testify about how God is always more than enough and more than we expect. Um, we grew up in a beautiful, wonderful home, and many times there was... Um, not extra, but there was always enough. And there's so many testimonies through our childhood of how God provided. I was able to finish school. We were five kids, so a lot of expenses. We're still five kids, um, but a lot of school fees, a lot of things that have to be paid. And God was just always there, and he always provided. And sometimes when there wasn't food, someone would just come knock on the door and say, hey, I had this extra KFC lying around or things like that. So we've got a lot of stories like that. You know when people bring you their extra KFC, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, obviously they're trying to be nice to let you not know that you're a charity case, but there's a lot of stories like that. Um, but somewhere as a child, if you're growing up and you, you see these things, then sometimes that poverty mindset starts to affect your identity and you start to see yourself that way. And, oh, you, you know, you pick up things. You realize, oh, okay, I'm being sponsored for school. I think we don't have money. <laughs> you know? Or, um, oh, the aftercare is also free. Okay, somebody heard a story that we need this, and somebody blessed me. So there's two ways you can see it. You can start to see yourself as the charity case, or you can just see God's hand and provision in everything. So I had a bit of both. Um, I can really say that there was always more than enough, but it also affected me later in life. I knew that God would always provide. I never doubted him being a good father. If I needed something, he was there. But I didn't know always that I actually had a chip on my shoulder um, with mindsets and dreaming big and the next level and all those things. So, um, so I'm going to quickly tell you a short story. But what I learned from this was just that when God gives, or what I learned throughout my life is when God gives, it is always beautiful. He gives not to just set us up. He's not the kind of dad who comes and gives you money and tells you to go away um, just so that you can have the money or that he just looks after your needs. He is a God who cares more about relationship and where you are with him and how you are positioned in front of him. And this I'm grateful for in my life. I'm grateful that I didn't just get all the stuff and that I was forced to seek him. Um, yeah, so that was one of the things he always gives in a beautiful way where he wants to bless us, but he doesn't want to just send us away with a blessing and care more about our vision or about our provision than about us. Um, and then when he gives, um, Pastor always speaks about this thing. I can't, only, I can't remember exactly how the story goes, but there's this one of these sermons or something Pastor always says, with a cell phone, 
um, where you're talking, where the dad is talking to the child and saying he's got a cell phone for him, but he's holding it actually behind his back so that he will first come to him. And then when he is here with him, I will give you the phone. So it's not about the phone, but it's about coming to God. Um, yeah, so that is just one of the things he always gives, and it's always beautiful when he gives. It's not just to bless me in a superficial way. Um, and then, yeah, I write here, even if we seek him, but we are not positioned in his heart, then we can ask, but it's in vain. And I, I was reminded of the scripture where Peter cut off the ear of the soldier who wanted to take Jesus. And then Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Um, and then Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his own life will lose it. But whoever his, who loses his life for me will find it. So that for me was beautiful that whenever we ask, um, as Esther was testifying now about God just providing, um, whenever we need things or whenever we ask, it can't be with a thing just to save my life, to, for me to have my little life and for my life to be protected. But my life I must lay down and then he will provide everything that's needed. So, um, yeah, so that's a beautiful, beautiful thing I've seen in my life. So my story, um, it was holiday. I was studying at Creori, and I'd gone home for the holidays. I was with my mom, and then she came home, and she said, I saw your friend at the, at the shop, and your friend was playing guitar at the shop with a cuss for money. Your friend was basking um, there. So I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. I wonder what, what it's for. Um, and the next day she came back. And then she said, I saw your friend again at the shop. I was playing guitar for money there. And then I, I bought him a juice and I bought him a pie. Like, is he struggling? Is he okay? Must we buy him something else? Um, because he's playing now in his holiday every day for money there at the spa, singing worship songs. And she's seeing him every day. So a few days later, she came back and she told me she saw him and she saw him again and she saw him again. And I started to get worried, like, sure, are you going to have a holiday? What's wrong? But I didn't want to ask. Um, yeah, so I just left it. And I actually thought, like, sure, I don't know if I will do that. I'll be, I'll feel like if I'm raising money for something, I'll feel very, like, you know, ashamed. Or there was a lot of shame in my life about actually asking for donations or asking someone for something when you need something. Because we don't want to look like we need anything because of how we grew up. You want to look like you're just fine. And you, you don't want to burden somebody because you're a burden. You've been a burden long enough, you know. Oh, I can finally buy my own stuff, you know. Now we're fine. Um, and at the end of the holiday, I get a phone call from this friend, and the friend says, hey, are you busy tomorrow, and um, do you, I want to take you shopping. So I was trying to put two and two together now, and this friend says, I, I just felt on my heart, I want to take you shopping, and I want to go buy you some clothes. And the first feeling that I felt, I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my goodness, do I look like I don't have clothes? Like, I must be dressing really badly. Why is this person doing this? And I was so flustered, and I didn't know what to say. Um, and I said, no, but why? But how now? And then, obviously, I'm thinking now, okay, you were playing guitar at the spa the whole time for money. You don't have money to take me now and buy clothes for me. Um, and I said, where is this money now coming from? He said, a certain amount that he felt on his heart that he must bless me with. And then he said, no, God told me I must do this, and I really want to do it. Please accept the blessing. And come with me and let's go buy you some clothes. So he came to fetch me, him and another friend. And then we went that morning and he said, um, I really want you to know that God said to me that he knows you know him as a father who provides your needs. But he wants to bless you with more than enough. He wants you to know that you are special. He's not always going to provide just the bare minimum. But he wants to lavish on you with abundance. And that's basically the word that he gave me. And then he took me to the shop and he bought me clothes of about 1,500, 2,000 rand, which was a lot 15 years ago for clothes. I was like, oh, it was amazing. But um, that day God provided not clothes. I didn't really necessarily need the clothes, but he brought a healing. He provided a healing in my heart, um, saying that he's not just going to, I'm not going to just make it by the skin of my teeth. He's going to always be there. As, as many people have said, emotionally he will provide Healing he will provide. He will provide whatever I need and more than enough. And if I only have him and I only have Jesus and I'm in the worst position ever, he is still more than enough. And that was such a revelation to me in my heart that it wasn't even about the things because God 
saw me. He was, it was like a, a testimony for me of my whole past, how he saw me, my heart, what I needed, and he spoke into that because he cares about me more than giving me the things. So it really healed me, and it, um, yeah, it really spoke to me that day. And the other facet of it is this, this man's obedience to listen to God because he didn't have money. God said he must sow. And he must do this thing. But imagine how God says to you, like who said it now? Uh, I think someone said here, if God says the, you must give this 2,000 rand, then we first think, oh, okay, it's metaphorical maybe, uh, the, the monopoly money I must give. Because if I don't have it, what do I give? But I was so blessed by this man's obedience to make a way to get what he needed to give to me. So he went and he actually sacrificed his own time to be able to bless me because he was actually praying for me and trusting God to do something in my life. And then he put his effort there to make it happen. And together, it was an amazing testimony. Yeah. So praise the Lord for that. Um, can I need to finish a bit for, for, no? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just want to pray for, um, for anyone who's here today. I just feel, just to pray for anyone who's here today who might be struggling with just that thing of poverty of, oh, I don't know if God's going to come through, but I know he will, but... I don't, you know, you almost, you almost have this poverty mindset or you feel like you can never do more. You must kind of stay there and you're not experiencing today that abundance of God that he wants to lavish on you, um, his love as a loving father. So let's just close our eyes and yeah, let me just pray. Father, we thank you that you are faithful as a father in every facet, as we've heard in so many testimonies this morning. Thank you that you love us that you know us and that you are more than enough in every facet, that when we look at our lives, we will be able to see your hand. We will see your hand of provision. Yeah, and I want to pray that any mindsets of poverty and of um, yeah, any mindsets of shame around finances will be broken in Jesus' name, that we will allow you to come and to speak to us and that we will not make money our God or our focus, but we will always choose you first in relationship and that will be more than enough, but that we will be so open to hear your voice and to receive as well that which you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon. Um, so very similar to Monique, I knew God could provide from a young age. I had so many testimonies of how my sister and I as students were walking, we didn't have food to eat, and we found 20 rand on the floor, and we could buy bread to eat. So I knew God as my provider, and I, and I had that information there. Um, but I didn't realize my identity was placed on how much I have and money. And I realized as, as a kid growing up, you're comparing the whole time. This guy is cool because he's got the fanciest what what, and he's got money to do this and do this. Um, and I didn't realize that it was identity, you know, that my identity was placed in do I have clothes to wear, do I have food. Um, and then also just to give some background on the story, I was very shy as a child. I wouldn't go into a shop to buy bread and milk for my dad. I wouldn't, because there was a possibility that I had to speak to someone. So I wasn't going to do it. Um, so just remember that when I tell this story. So um, I was already working for Creari, and I felt God said I must go to Malaysia to a conference um, that we have there with Dr. Jonathan. And I felt I had to go. God said I need to go. I knew I didn't have the finances, but... I knew God as provider, so I, I wasn't worried about it. And the first year that I went to this conference, God provided in amazing ways. I had more than enough money for the plane ticket, for accommodation, for eating there at restaurants. Like, it was good. Life was good. Um, I could even afford to buy gifts for everyone, all my friends, and bring it back, you know. So God provided miraculously in that way, and I knew he was going to provide. And um, the next year... He challenged me to go again, and through a few people, I just got confirmation, God wants me to go again to Malaysia. And I was like, ah, oh, he's going to provide, you know, he's done it before. Um, so I wasn't worried, but I, I knew that I needed to find out what his strategy was for the finances. I needed to also bring my side and be faithful. So I started saving up, but I couldn't get enough. I just got enough for the plane ticket. And then I felt that I mustn't ask other people. And I was like, <laughs> what am I going to do when I get there? And I knew in my bank account I didn't have enough to pay for the hotel. I knew it. But I felt I need to go. So I got on that plane, went to the conference, and I was going to be sharing a room with someone. So I knew they had to pay half and I have to pay half. 
And I was like, we're going to make this. God's going to provide. I don't know. Maybe there's going to be money in my, my bank when I swipe and it's going to be fine. And then Holy Spirit was like, what if there's not? What if there's not money in your bank account? And I was like, no, don't play games with me. <laughs> don't play games with me. But I had to then sit with Holy Spirit and say, okay, what if there's not? And Holy Spirit was like, I, I want to do something more in your life than just provide for you financially. I want to come and challenge this root that you've got. Because it was terrible that I had to go and possibly have this humiliation of not having the money. And it would be such an identity thing. And... Um, God just started speaking to me about it, and I had to release it all the way in the plane, and just like, I knew I was going to have to have this confrontation with myself, right? That person wasn't ever going to see me again, but I had to walk and deal with it. And um, so we get to the hotel, and my friend pays her part, and now it's my part to, to pay, and I know there's nothing. And I have to get the guts. Now, remember, the shy person didn't want to speak to people. Now, I have to get the guts and say, hi, can I make an arrangement? Can I pay at some other stage, like, before we leave? And that took so much out of me to, like, get to that point of, like, it's not about who I am. It's about God saying, I need to be here, and I'm going to honor him. He said, I need to be here. He's going to make a way. And so I went up to the person. And I'm like, hi, sorry being all casual, but I was like burning inside. Um, can I pay at the end of the week? And the guy's like chill. He's like, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. You know, can pay when, when you before you leave. And I'm like, cool. But now I still don't know where that money's coming from. <laughs> so at that point, Holy Spirit is like, but are you going to focus on me during this conference or are you going to focus on where the money's coming from? And it was such an amazing conference because I was so focused on God instead of worrying about my identity, worrying about where the money was going to come from. And at that stage um, in Creori, we never knew actually when our salary was coming in. Uh, it could be the first week of the, of the next month. It could be anywhere. And um, I remember going back to the hotel, I think it was on the second day of the conference, and seeing an SMS come through that our salary was in. And I could then pay for for the accommodation, but I walked away with such a breakthrough in my identity, knowing that I can be content whether I have, whether I don't have. And God then tested still after that. It's not like you've got this breakthrough and you never have to go through that situation again. Um, but I can testify even now in, in my marriage and how God provides for us. And he says we need to do things. And even if we're living in this amazing house that God said we need to buy, it's not my identity. My identity is not in it. And it was so amazing waking up the first night after being in this dream house and being like, I don't feel different. I'm, I'm okay. I'm still Donna that God has made. I'm not some fancy person or whatever. My identity was in him because of this breakthrough that he gave. So may you also just see your identity in him and be, as Paul says, uh, the scripture that Pastor shared in Philippians 4, to be content whether you have or whether you don't have. Your identity is not based on your bank account and what you have around you, what brand you're wearing. It's about him and being a child of God. Amen.